Skeptics will often say to me, oh, there's no proof of Jesus outside of the Bible, which in and of itself is a very weak argument for their position, but it's also wrong. And, um, you know, I could rattle off 10 or 11 uh, sources outside the Bible who weren't even followers or believers of Jesus. Now, forget about believers. I can go on all day with sources outside of the Bible. But today, I just chose three. Two are Roman pagans. One is a Jewish historian. None of them were followers of Jesus. They just reported what they knew to be true. So, we'll go back to uh, uh, Tacitus. He's uh, writing. He's a Roman historian in uh, the first century. And... Um, He's writing about the fire in Rome in 64 AD, and this is what he writes. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abomination called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, which is crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilatus. That's what the Bible says. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Then you have uh, Pliny the Younger. He was a governor in Asia Minor, and he was writing to uh, an emperor, Trajan, and um, he was telling what he found out about the Christians. He sent some spies to act like Christians to see what they believed because it was rumored that they were cannibals and they were evil. And this is what he wrote. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang an alternate verse as a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves by a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify the word, nor deny or trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. After which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Again, they said they ate the body of Christ and drank his blood. They didn't understand, the Romans didn't understand how we believe it supernaturally becomes that. But then we go to Josephus. He was a uh, Jewish historian, first century Jewish historian. I believe he was born a couple years after the crucifixion. And he wrote this. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. Every scholar alive today will say that's an authentic sentence. Some scholars are skeptical of the following. They think it may have been altered. And even if it has, it still shows you a source outside of the Bible that confirms Jesus in the first century. So this is where the, the uh, controversy is. For he wrought surprising feasts. He was the Christ. Or like if he was a Jew, he wouldn't call him a Christ unless he was converted. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love, again, Pilate, it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's two sources uh, uh, confirming Pilate had him crucified. Condemned him to be crucified. Those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared restored the life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared since. And the tribe of Christians has still not disappeared. Now, I could go on with other sources outside the Bible, but I really don't need to, because to say the New Testament is not worthy to look at as a historical document is to look at it anachristically, which means you're looking at it out of its date it was written. So, it was written within a few years of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But you're looking at it as a skeptic. Oh, well, this is the Bible. We can't believe the Bible because it's a religious book. So just because the church decided hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later, to take these authentic documents, these historical documents, and put them in a book and call that book the New Testament, you're saying... Uh, it, the his, historicity of is, is no good. That That is not scholarly. That is not how any historian will look at it. Scholars today and historians today are in agreement that the New Testament is the most reliable ancient manuscripts we have. And they give good reasons for it. So 
if you look, if you look at the New Testament, just from a historical perspective, how historians look at ancient documents, you look, well, how close to the event or the person that's reporting on did it happen? Well, the Gospel of Mark is dated 60 AD. First Corinthians, uh, the letter St. Paul wrote to the uh, church in Corinth, is dated about 50 AD. Now, so it's very close in historical terms. For example, most scholars and historians accept uh, the biography of Alexander the Great. The oldest biography we have was written 400 years after his death. But in terms of history, ancient history, that's reasonable. Scientifically, historically, that's reasonable. Another thing they look at is how many manuscripts. So you can compare copies. You can compare copies. So the New Testament has over 20,000 historical manuscripts, ancient manuscripts that we can compare. The second most reliable is uh, Homer's Iliad with less than 650 manuscripts. And then third and fourth, you're talking like dozens or less that scholars and historians take as authentic. So the New Testament is far and beyond the most reliable historical source we have for ancient history. Uh, Bruce Metzger, uh, Princeton University pe uh, professor, passed away said not only do we do do does the new testament have the most manuscripts of any ancient uh documents that we know of they also uh, show that it's true by that way it's written and reported so for example he points out that it's reported that mary and martha found the empty tomb of jesus well, he said, you know, that'd be no big deal today, but 2,000 years ago, the witness of women was worthless. No one would, would take the witness of women uh, as fact. If a man didn't say it, they wouldn't believe it. So when he was asked, well, why would the apostles write that the empty tomb was found by women? And he said, because that's what happened. <laughs> if you look at it historically, they were just reporting the truth. And even his student, uh, who calls himself a atheist agnostic now, Dr. Bart Ehrman, and um, you know, skeptics love this guy because he's considered one of the best uh, Greek manuscripts uh, uh, critiquers, I guess you uh, manuscript scholars. Uh, and recently on a radio show, when he was pressed about uh, the accuracy of the New Testament, and he was asked, well, what do you think the New Testament really says? He was forced to admit the New Testament says what it says. And they're like, well, I thought there were all these variants. He said, it's 99% pure. <laughs> you know, we can, we have historical documents to prove, and we have the scholarship to critique to see the New Testament is 99% pure. So that 1% that's off doesn't change any Christian doctrine. It's just simple words like uh, where John says, may your joy be complete. We're not sure if he meant to say your or he meant to say our because some of the manuscripts are missing the Y. So we don't know if they added the Y or the Y was left off in certain manuscripts. And there's simple words like that, like the. There's no doctrine that, can, that was changed by these variants. And even Richard Dawkins uh, in a debate with uh, John Lennox, they're both uh, Oxford University professors, and they're friends, but John Lennox, in my opinion, much smarter guy, PhD in mathematics, I think he's got a PhD in philosophy as well from Oxford and Cambridge, debating Richard Dawkins on the existence of God, uh, said to Richard Dawkins, you recently stated that uh, we don't even know Jesus existed. Now, you wanna take that back? Because there's no scholar alive today that would agree with you. And Richard Dawkins said, well, I misspoke. <laughs> but he also miswrote it in one of his books, too. He didn't mention that. He said, I misspoke. Of course, Jesus existed. He just didn't perform the miracles. And that's the presupposition of these skeptic scholars. 
Bart Ehrman will tell you, yes, the New Testament is accurate. It is what they wrote. It wasn't altered. We, we, can, we have manuscripts going all the way back. You know, the original copies we don't have, but we don't have the original copies of most ancient uh, writings. But they go back 1,800 years. And they're the same as what's translated today with like less than 1% variant. So Bart Ehrman believes the New Testament is reliably, is historically reliable, but he doesn't believe that the miracles could be true, that they just wrote this. Uh, he doesn't believe they could be true because he's never seen one. So it's his presupposition that miracles are, aren't true. So it's not a very historical way to, to look at historical documents. It's not a very scientific way to look at documents. Uh, now, my presupposition would be, if God did become a man, of course there would be miracles. So the miracles actually prove that it's true, what they're saying. So now that we know the New Testament is an accurate, actually the most accurate, reliable source of ancient history, let's see what it has to say about the resurrection. Because if Christ didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is false. So this is the letter to the Corinthians by St. Paul written in 50 AD. And he says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So, okay, so he didn't, he wasn't with Christ when Christ was alive. He became a follower after. And this is what he learned from Christ's followers. In accordance with the scripture that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, one witness, 10 to the 12, 13 witnesses. And then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive. So he's saying this back then. Again, you can't look at, at it anachristically. You have to look at it in the time and date. He's reporting this. So there's eyewitnesses that can say, no, you're a liar. Um, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So you're talking over 500 eyewitnesses accounts. This is how we know the resurrection happened. Now, you might say, you know, I don't know. I think uh, still that's kind of arrogant for you to say all the other religions are wrong. And then my response would be, well, your, your, your response is kind of arrogant arrogant saying Jesus is wrong because Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life he says that in these historical New Testament documents you know and you may say well well there's different roads you know it's one mountain that leads to God and there's all different roads you know you hear this from all the new age religions but did you ever think like Peter Criff says that the road came down the hill not up the hill you see Christianity is unique amongst all religions in that all other religions so we can earn our way to salvation we can work our way to god christianity says no you can't you're not you'll never be good enough so god came down to us and became man that's what we were about to celebrate tomorrow and he died for us even way back in 419 at the catholic council of carthage Canon number 113 says, if you can, if you say that you can get to heaven apart from the grace of God, you're anathema. If you say you can get to heaven apart from the grace of God, but it'll be a little more difficult, you're anathema. Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Not apart from me, you can do it, but it'll be a little more difficult. So then, if you accept Christianity as true... And you accept that Jesus showed you, listen, I don't want you guessing. I don't want you mistaken. There's one way, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then it's then you have to realize, okay, well, did he give us, what, what did he leave us? Well, he left us a church. He left us a church. And we can see this in these new historic, in these reliable historical documents, Matthew 16. 18 and 19. And he says, And I tell you, you are Peter. And Jesus spoke Aramaic. And in Aramaic, he was saying Petros. We translate to Peter. 
and it means rock. There's one word in Aramaic that means rock, and it's Petros. And I tell you, you're Petros, and uh, uh, well, they're, they're, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ha I know I have some scholars watching. I literally do, and they'll correct me. Petros is the Greek, which it was translated into, but it was translated from an Aramaic word that means rock. And there's only word, and it escapes me now. <laughs> this is blue-collar Catholic, not scholar Catholic. Peter, okay, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Okay, one church, singular, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the church that Jesus gave us, the one church, has authority. So in, in ancient times, in the Old Testament, when a king would leave his kingdom, he would leave a prime minister or a leader in charge, and he would give them the keys to the kingdom. That symbolically meant that he has the same authority as me until I return. So he's given Peter the same authority he has to bind and loose. And then how is this authority used? Well, write down a couple more verses, a couple more chapters. 18, Matthew 18, 15 to 18. Just gives one example how, do you, how, how the church uses this authority. Um, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. What church? The church that Jesus established. One church that Jesus established. Let him be to... And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he gave one church this authority to teach us. And what does history tell us? That one church, well, you can trace all the apostles to every one of our bishops. You can trace all our bishops to the apostles. This is what we call apostolic tradition. And there's only two churches that can do that. The Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic Church. Now, Jesus also taught his apostles doctrines. And he promised that the gates of hell will not prevail. So these doctrines must stay pure. Well, throughout the Bible, you see Jesus telling his disciples, this is my blood, this is my body. St. Paul telling the church, if you eat the body and blood in an unworthy manner, you're going to get sick and die. Um, what church still believes that? Well, there's only two churches that still believe this, and that would be the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic Church. And then Jesus also told his disciples, uh, his apostles in John uh, 20, 23, as the Father has sent me, I will send you. What did the Father send Jesus to, to do? To forgive sins. And it said Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on him and said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven and whose sins you retain are retained. What church believes that priests can forgive sins still? Our Eastern Orthodox brothers and the Catholic Church. But then there was a split a thousand years after Jesus started this church. And the Eastern Orthodox decided they were not going to follow the Bishop of Rome. And historically, you can look at the list of the bishops of Rome, what we call Pope. Uh, it's just a, uh, a name meaning Papa, an affectionate name, but it's the Bishop of Rome. Started with Peter, and then Linus was second, and then Cleus was third, then Clement, and all the way to today, 260 popes, till we get to Pope Francis. So the Catholic Church is the only church that can claim that we are the church that Jesus Christ started. And you may say, well, the Catholic Church has a really bad history. They did some really bad things. Our doctrines have never changed. We have an unbroken chain of our doctrines from the first century. And yes, the church has done some sinful things because the church is made up of sinful men. If Jesus waited for perfect men to start his church, we would still be waiting for Jesus to start his church. In the same way, if we waited for Jesus, if Jesus waited for perfect men to write his Bible, we would be waiting for the Bible still. 
but Jesus chose imperfect, sinful men that sometimes did great miracles for God and yet sometimes did some evil things. But they were inspired to write the New Testament. And then he took his church, his imperfect men that made up the church, but he gave them the gift of infallibility to choose which books would be in the Bible. And that church, again, is the only church there was at the time. In 382 AD at the Council of Rome, the Catholic Church chose which 73 books would be in the Bible. Then again, they reaffirmed that in 393 AD at the Council of uh, Hippo, and then 397 AD and 419 AD in the Councils of Carthage. Then again, in, I, I believe in the 5th century, um, I'm sorry, in the 4th century, 14th century or 15th, 15th century at the Council of Florence. And then even after Martin Luther by himself decided that seven of those books, what we call our deuterocanonical books, were apocrypha and took them out of his Bible and made the Protestant Bible 66 books. Again, right after that, the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church reaffirmed what we've always taught was the Bible. So if you want to go to a Bible-believing church, come to the Catholic Church because we believe the whole Bible, not what one man, Martin Luther, told us the Bible was. Now, again, you say, yeah, but the Catholic Church is, you know, if you're a skeptic and an atheist, uh, the, the, what organization would do such terrible things? Uh, human mankind, mankind does some sinful things, you know, but what great things have they done? Catholic Church has built the greatest civilization. The Catholic Church has built Western civilization. The Catholic Church invented the university system. The Catholic Church invented the hospital system. The Catholic Church invented the Western law system. The Catholic Church created Western civilization. So, this Christmas, if you're still a skeptic, I would recommend um, taking a chance. Pascal's Wager. If what you believe is right and you become a Christian anyway, when you die, you lose nothing. You lived a good life following a, a good man if you don't believe Jesus was the Christ. But if I'm right and you're wrong, you're jeopardizing your soul for eternity. And then you might say, well, what about those who never heard of Christ? It's not fair. Well, the Catholic Church addressed that in many councils, and they addressed it logically. Uh, but if you want me to do a video about that, just put it in the comments. But the point is, if you want to experience the joy of Christmas, experience Christ. If you're a skeptic, just come to a Catholic service. Christmas Eve service is beautiful. Just go and ask Christ to reveal himself to you. He needs to prove it to you logically, but maybe first you need to feel him spiritually and know spirituality does exist. There's something beyond what the eye can see. And if you're a Catholic Christian that's been out of the church, been out of the Catholic church for a long time, come back. Come back. And you say, well, you know, you guys call yourself Catholics, but, you know, Acts says they were called Christians. Yes, they were called Christians. And in fact, um, the third bishop of Antioch, St. Ignatius of Antioch, in 108 AD, said, where the Catholic Church is, there is Jesus Christ. And that same St. Ignatius of Antioch is the one who told us who coined the, the phrase Christian in Antioch. It was the second bishop of Antioch, Evodius, who was ordained by Peter when Peter, uh, the first bishop of Antioch, went to Rome. He left Evodius in charge. And Evodius coined the phrase Christians. So yes, according to J.N.D. Kelly, a Protestant scholar and historian... Very early on in the first centuries, Christians started calling themselves Catholic Christians to distinguish themselves from the cults that went around and said the Trinity wasn't real, Jesus didn't really come in the flesh, uh, all these weird ideas. They said, no, if you're a Catholic Christian, you believe what the apostles taught. And the leaders of the church must prove apostolic succession, which the Catholic Church can. So again, if you're a non-Catholic believer, Come home to the church that Jesus Christ established 
and give yourself the best gift for Christmas, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Come and adore the Christ child. You can come and endure, adore Jesus Christ this Christmas. You can adore his flesh and his blood. You can endure, adore the body and blood and full divinity of Christ in your Catholic church. So I, I, I plead with you, come tonight, Christmas Eve service, or tomorrow morning, the Christmas Day service. And if you're still a skeptic, ask God to show you the truth. And don't go with a presupposition, God doesn't exist. Go with someone who's seeking the truth, with the boldness to go wherever the truth leads them. God bless. Stay Catholic. And if you're buying or selling real estate this holiday season, please go to realestateforlife.org.